united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning and welcome to United with Christ. I'm Wally Chapman, your host this morning. And I have the privilege of interviewing a pastor from Phoenix, uh, Dr. David Bowen. David, we're glad you're here. And tell us uh, a little bit about Phoenix and your church and, and all of that. Well, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me here, Wally. It's sure. just a joy to be in Texas, back in Texas, yeah. you know, be able to do ministry together. And in Phoenix, I, I pastor a church called Standing Stones Community Church. Uh, Standing Stones comes from Joshua 4. Okay. So when, when they were led into, into the promised land, they went through and they had the Jordan River was overflowing and the priests had to put their foot in to stop the river and God did a miracle and all of Israel crossed over. But when they went over, they, uh, they went back and got 12 stones out of uh -huh. the river and they brought 12 stones out. And the purpose of that was to be memorial stones, saying that when the next generation comes, they don't know what happened here, they're going to see these stones and say, what did God do? So the, next, the, the stones were for the next generation. So the name of the church being standing stones is A, we, we love Israel, but B, everybody should be a standing stone. We, wow. Everybody should be able to look at us and say, look what God has done in you, wow. know, especially the next generation. That's yeah. what's the name of the church. Wow. Well, I, because I've been to Phoenix a few times, I thought it had something to do with an Indian name. No, it has all to do with <laughs> Joshua 4. And that just goes to show you people get into the scriptures and they think, well, this is what it means. And they don't explore it and they get led way off astray, just like I just did. Right. It was interesting because we used to, you know, we used to give out CDs of the sermons and they were free in the lobby. And one lady was going through this whole stack of sermons one time. And, and I said, well, can I help you? And she goes, well, I want to find the sermon from last week, but I can't find it. And she would have been on the top. She goes, all these sermons are Joshua 4. And I said, well, that's just the passage for the, for the church. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyhow. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting because... Uh, you know, the Indian influence is, is strong in Phoenix, isn't it? It, I is. Mean, it is. With the reservation there and all. Pretty much like in the desert, you, you kind of get that. Yeah. The Aztec yeah. feel. Right. Yeah. So you have written a book, and tonight this book will be available if you look at the telethon. It's called Finally the Book of Revelation Made Easy. And so I encourage you to watch tonight. And as you give to the church, uh, give to the station, you can get a copy of this book. And no one ever says revelation is easy. So, and, and that's the whole point. That's why, because I have a passion and a heart for what's coming next. Um, when you look at what the, what's happening in the world, uh, it was interesting. We're, I'm in a hotel here, obviously, and, and I was in the, in the lobby. I've got my worship team. My worship team will be playing tonight, and, and they are waiting for them. And the lady behind the desk asked a coworker. She said, do you think God is coming soon? Well, obviously, that, that perked my ears up, you know, because mm -hmm. I turned around and I kind of rudely looked at her and said, do you think so? And she said, I do. So I went up to the counter and started talking to her. I said, well, why do you think that? And, and she said, well, because all that's going on in the world, God has to come back soon. So I asked her, I said, well, do you go to church? Now, she had no idea who I was, why I was here. I'm just somebody, a, you know, a customer in the lobby. And I said, do you go to church? And she said, no, I, I don't go to church. Uh, and I said, well, who is God coming back? for then? And she goes, for his children. And I said, are you one of his children? And she said, well, I hope so. And I go, well, no, there's an assurance when you understand who Jesus is. But just that understanding where people say something is going on and I don't get it. And, and the tribulation period is coming. It doesn't matter, you, you know, the rapture, people have different views on it. We go back and forth. Are you free to Are you this? I don't care about that. Everybody agrees on the tribulation because it's so clearly in scripture. But mm -hmm. no one in the church talks about it. Mm. And many believers look at the book of Revelation and they open it up and they say, this is a scary book with all this stuff going on. Or they say, there's so much, I don't understand it, all the symbolism and everything else. So I dug into it and I, I became a real student of this book. And really the key is the Old Testament. Mm. And we are doing, tonight we're doing a whole segment on this. So please turn in tonight to watch this. But the whole segment tonight is understanding this through the Old Testament because the Old Testament explains it explicitly. And then once you take it in context in the Old Testament and you put it over in Revelation, it opens up for you. Right. And it's interesting. Uh, when I was in college, I had to do four years of Hebrew. So mm -hmm. 
we had to do some a lot of the Old Testament. And mm -hmm. I loved, I was a history guy, so mm -hmm. I loved the history of what's going on and back and forth. And you come back to the church and everybody's just read the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And they don't get into the Old Testament, what's involved in yeah. the whole lot. And gee, you miss out so much. Yeah. And this, I mean, Paul's writing, Paul quotes Isaiah constantly. Well, you have to understand that he knew Isaiah. Jesus talks about everything that's written. I mean, the greatest Bible study ever would have been the Rho de Mas when he's walking with them. And he right. says, I'm going to explain to you everything from the Old Testament that talks about me. What kind of Bible study would that have been? <laughs> but he walked them through the Old Testament. So to understand the New Testament, there's an assumption made that you have the foundation of the old. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the foundation of the old, you really don't understand the new. Right. And uh, it's, it's just so, so great. And people get... If they read the Old Testament, they read the stories, or they got the stories from when they were a kid. Uh, but then you get to Isaiah, or you get to some of the others, and they just bail out. And it's really sad. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Well, you get the question sometimes, too, about the Bible. Um, well, you know, the Bible is just written by a bunch of men. You think God wrote it, but really it's a bunch of men. And, and these are the authors, and these are the names. And, and, but really, the way you, I, I look at that, so to understand the Bible, the Bible is outside of time. <laughs> yeah, Isaiah wrote part of that. You know, some critics would say that there's three Isaiahs oh, because yeah. there's 200 years and everything else. But, okay, Isaiah wrote this, but think about Christmas. We've got Christmas coming up in seven, eight, whatever, whatever it is, weeks. And he wrote about that. And because of the Old Testament, I mean, we, churches will be preaching Isaiah during Christmas. How did Isaiah know about the Messiah? How did Micah know where the Messiah was going to be born? I mean, we have all the Christmas information 700 years before it happens. How could man do that? He yeah. couldn't. It, it's outside the scope of time because God's, it's, it's on that. It's God breathed. And the whole Bible, including the last book of the Bible. Yeah. So. And when you talk about the, uh, the Christmas story and Jesus' birth, you know, and they say, oh, Jesus made it all happen. How did he make place of birth happen? Yes. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's just amazing. Yeah. So you're looking at end times a lot. I enjoy end times because it's coming and I think the people need to be aware of it. And I'm not going to say anything. If you went to a doctor and, and you weren't feeling well and the doctor ran some tests, but he didn't want to upset you. He didn't want you to be bothered. So, but the test came back very negative and you were very sick. So you went back to get the results and the doctor looked at you and said, oh, everything's fine. It's going to be okay. But it's not. And you find out later on that you're very ill. How would you feel about that doctor? I'd be ticked, you know? The church knows what's coming, but the church is doing a very poor job. The church in general, the evangelical church in general, is doing a very poor job of preparing the people for the tribulation. Okay. So, and people are saying, well, you know what? Every generation has thought they were the last ones. Everyone since the Apostle Paul, I agree with that. Everyone since the Apostle Paul thought that they would be the last generation. Do you know what? One will be right. Who is it going to be? But what people miss is understanding when Jesus talked, I mean, they're at the, in Matthew 24, they're at the, the temple mm -hmm. and, and him and the boys, the disciples are coming out of the temple <clears> and they're looking at this amazing structure. And Herod was a master builder, Sure. but he was a madman, but he was a master builder. So the, the boys are looking at, the disciples are looking at all this amazing work and they comment on that. And then Jesus starts teaching the Olivet Discourse, discourse meaning teaching on the Mount of Olives about end times. And he says there'd be wars and rumors of wars and famine and earthquakes. And people say, well, see, that's always been the case. But also in the Old Testament, it says that things have to happen in order for that to happen. First of all, Israel's got to be a nation. Second, Jerusalem has to be the capital. And third, the Jews have to be back in their homeland. In the Old Testament, there's only two regatherings, one after Babylon and then one in end times. Because that is so true, that's why the end times get me, gets me excited. Now, Israel was not a nation until 1948. Right. So any earthquake, famine, war before 1948 wouldn't have counted. Jerusalem's not the capital until 1967 when they paratroop in, they touched the Western Wall for the first time in 1900 years. And now, for the first time in our, genera in our lifetime, there are more Jews living in Israel than out. Hmm. And when you go to Israel and you spend time walking there and you ask them, you hear the people with the stories, they say, I just felt called back. They, they, they know their spiritual roots are there, but they didn't, never, never lived there before, but they just felt God calling them back. And he is. He's calling his family back. He's calling the, the Israelites back. And when, when Israel is filled with Jews, 
That's when Matthew 24 can happen. And we are the first generation that can say that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, was, I went to college in Australia, okay? Mm -hmm. And just before I got there, there was some guy who said that Jesus was coming at a certain day mm -hmm. and everybody in there in the church, mm -hmm. he was going to come over Sydney Harbor, mm -hmm. the, the heads, headland of Sydney. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody in the church went and sold their houses and did everything else and went and stood for this morning when Jesus was going to return. And then it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I kept wondering, why did they sell their house? I mean, they can't take it with them. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was an act of faith, but we've had these kooks. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, yeah, all these times. So how do you uh, discern? Scripture. Scripture has to interpret Scripture. That's what okay. I'm saying. Jerusalem being, being the capital, Israel being a nation, it's in Scripture. So Zechariah talks about this. These things have to happen, which Jesus knows. So he talks about Matthew 24, about in the end times. Um, there's the birth pains. Yep. And part of the birth pains, the last one is the gospel being preached around the world. We have the technology to do that now. Again, everything is converging in our lifetime. But there have been people who try to date it and we're told not to put a date on it. It's just have to have, to have scripture. I, I believe to really have a balanced view. And when you talk about end times, you have to have a balanced view. Right. The first thing you got to look at is scripture. It's like three lenses. The first lens is scripture. The second lens is history. Then the third lens is world of events and culture. There are some people who want to take everything that happens in the world and say, oh, it's, it's the end times. No, what's scripture say? And then what's history say? What's happened before? We can learn a lot from that. Biblical and, and, and American history, you know, world history. But then you get the, the cultural view. There are some very wonderful people who are very much scholars in history. Yourself? Well, you know, I'm not a scholar. Well, you understand history, <laughs> but probably more so than me. There's some people who have biblical knowledge and probably more so than me. And there's some people who understand pulp culture and everything else more so than me. But very few people, if any, put all three together. And that's how you have a balanced view of end times. Okay, so. okay. Um, join us tonight at 7 o'clock. You're going to hear Dr. Bowen speak a couple of times explaining things that are going on in the world and the end times. And you'll be here this weekend for several days, aren't you? Gonna I am. I'm excited. I'm here all weekend. I have two tonight and uh, six on Sunday. And I believe we're going to do something on the Spanish show tomorrow. So, um, and what, some of the topics, one of the things you just brought up about I've heard this before. I've been hearing this for, you know, 50 years. That's one of the topics. The tribulation is one of the topics. We're going to have some topics that people, I think, are excited about and don't get a lot of information on. Sure. And his book, finally, the book of Revelation Made Easy, you can pick it up tonight as you'd give a donation to the station. So it's, it's, it's not a little bit of writing. There's a lot of work in here. Yeah. And I thought what was so good when I usually look at books this size it's fill in the blank. Well, you didn't do that. You just kept putting the scriptures and showing proof texts. It's scripture, it's scripture. And I, I, I'm careful saying proof text. Right. Because <laughs> so often we find one verse, you know, right. and, and all scriptures inspired. When that was written, it was only the Old Testament was talking about, wasn't right. it? I'll tell you what, I, I'm so excited <clears throat> about this. I'm so excited about the people calling in. I will say it right now. The first 20 who call in and give tonight, I will autograph a copy for them. Okay. Be happy your, to personalize it. Your autograph is a whole lot more valuable than mine. Well, not much, but... <laughs> mine just, even in the check. I just put a little note to them personally. Yeah, it's just when I write the checks. <laughs> they even check my signature. So. There you go. <laughs> oh, I'm joking. Yeah. Of course. Well, wh tell us about your church and what's... What are your... Is, is End Times part of the emphasis? It is. I do teach about it. Uh, again, it's balanced. I mean, right now I've been in a series of the Book of Romans. So I, I, my Sunday messages have been Romans. I teach Wednesday night. That's been in Genesis. So if I'm, if I'm teaching, if I'm preaching on New Testament in, on Sunday mornings, I'm doing Old Testament midweek or vice versa. So okay. it's, been, it's been Romans and Genesis has been the focus for this year. Well, good, yeah. good. So, well, I, again, you've got to have balance with the scriptures. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you're not afraid of the Old Testament. In fact, you're probably really excited about it. I, I, I don't think you really understand the Bible without feeling comfortable with it. Sure, yeah. sure. And a big church? No, it's, just, it's a small church. I, we started 18 years ago. Um, I had, I had six week old twins when we started it. So it was me, my wife, the twins. I think we had 11 total uh, at the beginning. And then we kind of, we were in a house and it kind of grew from there. And yeah, well, we started a preschool nine years ago and that's good. started a food bank as well. Cause that was one of the needs of the community. And so what part of Phoenix are you in? We're in Northeast Phoenix. Okay. Yeah. Northeast okay. Phoenix. 
Is Scottsdale that way too or not? Is Scottsdale is a little bit more, more east of us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're really glad that you're here. We've uh, Anything special that happened in your life that, that brought God alive to you? You know, just really, uh, no one, I can't, I go back, I, I don't remember anybody really just sharing the gospel with me. It was just, I was actually in a, stu- I was in a, in a Bible study, um, and I, had, I, did not grow, I did not grow up in church. I did not understand church. In fact, when I, I was in my 20s, when the Bible was first presented to me, and um, I went out and borrowed a children's book, trying to understand the stories. Because I never, I never went to Sunday school, never heard them, didn't know them. I, I remember once as a child, I went to church. Don't know why I went there. Someone took me, and they had communion. And I had no idea what it was. Um, really, I should have, I should have, I, I shouldn't have really been taking communion, but I did. I asked for seconds. So I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so it was, was past. I said, can we have more? I yeah. asked for a second. You know? So, I mean, that was the only, only experience I had at church. But God just kind of got a hold of me, kind of like calling the Jews back. And God got a hold of me, and, and I became like a sponge. I wanted to really learn. I wanted to understand. And that's why I teach that way. I, I, I teach as if you don't understand. And I ask people, where are you at with God right now? It doesn't matter where you're at. You know, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you? You could be a 1 or a 2, which is fine. You just can't stay there. So how do you go from a 2 to a 3? And from a three to a four, and just keep drawing closer and closer to God, and that's kind of what he what he did with me. So. Okay, and you were um, you were affiliated with the movie industry, I understand. I was involved with uh, by mistake. I got involved with the film in the industry, yeah. And I had some go. I went to Hollywood when I was in my early twenties. Um, I went out there to be a stunt man. That was my heart. That's what I wanted to do. But God had different plans. Uh, I met some some young guys who are my age, and they were forming a production company. And we started working on a script, and we actually got it made and produced, and MGM UA released it. So once you have the lion back then, you know, behind you, yeah. things were pretty good. But then I started getting this Bible study. And, and as I was in the Bible study, I'm, I'm making movies and planning for movies over here, but I'm going to church and getting Bible studies over here, and God is just touching me and changing me, and I, I couldn't do the material anymore. Mm. I just, I couldn't, I, I walked away from it. You know, and didn't know what to do. Uh, it was six months of just loving the Lord, and you know, I lost everything, but I was never more free. Wow! And that—that's a common comment people yeah. make when Jesus is in your life. He just changes things so he much. He does, and he's been providing. I don't know how we've got by thirty years since then, but he's always provided and always been faithful. Yeah. When we uh, when I started the church here locally at Park Hills Christian, um, there were twenty eight people there, mm-hmm. twenty three over sixty. I was the youngest adult. And then my wife came and from Australia. We got married, and uh, so we're living on virtually nothing. Mm-hmm. I took a cut in pay working three-quarter time at Kmart to be the full-time pastor of the church. Mm-hmm. And so for a long time, we, lived, we could have gotten food stamps, but we never did. We said, we're going to trust God, and he was so faithful. He, is. he always is, and I think people don't realize how faithful he really is to people who will trust him. Amen. And... Uh, that's how our church just kept going was because it was there. And whenever we seemed to need money, some people gave. Yeah. And uh, twice we've had people who have died and left money to the church who's bailed us out of some big problem because, yeah. you know, we just got a new roof and a friend who had come to Christ had died and left money to the church and it's going to pay for our roof. Yeah. Um, you just sit and look at it and just just awe at how great God is. It is. We've raised our kids that way, too. Our, our, our model in the house is God first. And the kids have grown up with that. So they, they understand that. And that works great until they use it against you, you know. But um, <laughs> it's always God first. So if we need to do something for the church, and, and that's, that's how the kids use it against me. We had to do something for the church, and we were going to go for dinner. And my thinking is to go for dinner first before the crowd gets there so we can get in and get out. But they say, but, Dad, it's God first. All right, let's go to the church. Get done. We need to get done, and then we'll go have dinner. Um, it's just when you have that, when you really have that love and that passion and that attitude, God takes care of everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have part of what the Lord's done for me is make me a, I have a heart for pastors. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that I've said to pastors, don't lose your kids for the sake of the ministry. Yeah. It's God first, your family second, and then your job. Mm-hmm. And your, the church is your job. Mm-hmm. And so don't, don't let your kids mess up and miss out. And that goes with, with anybody as far as raising kids. And put, sure. It's, it's what you, I used to be a, because I, I was a ball player before I got hurt. And that, that, was my, that was my God growing up with sports. 
Uh, but God opened a door up later on in life to be a, a chaplain at Baseball Chapel. It was a volunteer position, but it got me back in the ballpark and got me with pro athletes, and I really enjoyed it. It was in my, in my element. And I used to hate the last week in March because that was spring training, and that's when final cuts were. And, and guys would get cut, and if they weren't picked up, they would say, what am I going to do now? What am I going to tell people? And i go, no, baseball is what you do. It's not who you are. And that's what the script is all about. You know, we do things, but it's not who we are. Our identity is in Christ. And that's why we need to be understanding who Christ is and what he's done for us, not what we do for him. But the job and, and raising kids, it's what we do. It's not, it's not who we are. We have to understand who we are. Right. You know, I was thinking again about end time things. And I saw an interview with Bill Bright before he died, mm. and quite a few years before he died. And he said that uh, people keep coming up to me and saying, I hope Jesus comes tomorrow. I really want to get out of here. And he says, well, I don't. I have too many friends who are going to hell if mm -hmm. Jesus comes tomorrow. And he had, I think he had the healthy side of looking at the end times. We've got a job to do, and the other people were just looking after for themselves, yeah. what they want out of it. The great white throne judgment, and again, we won't be, uh, it, it's an understanding of end times, the end of millennial period. Just to think that there could be people who are going to be facing that. Um, I try to tell people the tribulation could be just a few years away. We don't know when it's going to, there's no time. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but the tribulation could be a few years away, which means you could have loved ones that you care for that could go through this period. It's going to be the worst period in, in human history. So says the scriptures. That's the urgency. That's, that's why we do what we do. If it was just about becoming a Christian, well, God could kill us and take us home the minute we came, became saved. But we're the weakest vessel he could possibly use. And he gets the most glory by using us to, to preach his word and to, to be his hands and feet. So as the weakest vessel possible, that's all I want to do is be a servant. And God blesses that. How would you help people to get off of their self-centered idea and want to do that, want to serve God and want to go out and tell others? To go try it and see what God does. Okay. Um, start off working in a food bank. Start off, when people become selfish, I ask them to go do, go volunteer somewhere. Because once you start giving, and once you start doing for other people and not thinking about yourself, things change. Um, it, when I was a youth pastor many, many years ago, we used to take kids down to Mexico. And we used to VBS, do VBSs and reach the kids. And the people in Mexico were so happy. They had so much joy. They were wonderful people. But they materialized, they had very little. Right. And you look around and see these kids running on dirt streets with no shoes, just laughing, having a great time, having joy. And you get the Americans to come home and they have no joy. And they're all into materialistic stuff. And when I brought kids down there and they saw that, we would have to have a, a meeting about a week or so afterwards because they came back and they got angry because they saw what it was like to just love the Lord and not to be caught up in worldly things. So the way to get rid of selfishness and the, and the, is to put the focus on somebody else. Mm. And that's what the gospel is all about, is, is God first and love God, love people. Yeah. My mother had a lot of problems with depression. Mm -hmm. And the minister said to her, you need to go to the hospitals and help people that are in the hospital, even if you just Absolutely. take magazines around or you do something Absolutely. to make a difference. It, it changes your heart. Yeah. It changes your, your emotions, but it also changes your heart. Yeah. Because you know, hey, God can use me. <clears throat> People say, well, God can't use me. You don't know my past, my background, what I've done. It doesn't matter. You know, compared to some disciples, it doesn't matter. But God can use you. Well, and I always thought he used Balaam's donkey. I guess I'm a little better than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just have a couple more minutes. Sure. Is anything you'd like to say to the audience about... Uh, tonight and what you're going to talk about? I'm just excited about being able to have this opportunity and we are going to talk about end times. We will talk about topics from a very balanced point of view, but we're going to talk about topics I think everybody wants to know, but they don't know how to get answers to because many churches, and again, it's a general statement, many churches aren't teaching on it. Um, then you do have some people who teach on it, but they get so far off base that you don't stay with the, the really understanding part. So I'm looking for it. I got, I think, eight different opportunities to share um, just really about what's happening in end times and what to look forward to and to be prepared, not just to survive, but to serve God and be ready. Good. Well, this has been Dr. David Bowen. He's from Phoenix, uh, from Standing Stones, Standing Stones Community, Community Church. Church. Yep. And he's written this book, Revelation, and I even forgot the title, The Book of Revelation Made Easy. And uh, tonight he's going to be talking about some that's in here. 
This book is going to be available through the telethon tonight. And so between 7 and 9 p.m., uh, you can hear and see and, and be involved. Uh, it's nice to be around someone who takes all the scriptures together and brings it instead of saying, well, I think it's this or I think it's something else. Uh, so would you uh, tune in tonight and get enlightened with some of the book of Revelation from a person who is not a kook, but someone who's done, done his homework and put it all together? This has been United with Christ. This program is geared every day of the week. English from 11 to 11.30 and in Spanish from 11.30 to 12 with pastors and teachers every day. And I just thank the station for giving me the opportunity to interview David. And we look forward to what you're going to do tonight. I think it's going to be really exciting. I think it's going to be entertaining as well as very educational. So come and join us. God bless you. Amen.